Hi, my name is Jonas. I'm from a company called Mindjumpers, and I'm here today to talk to you about uh, big data and social media and the correlation between the two. If we start out with uh, seeing what big data is, basically over the last uh, two couple of years, 90% of all data on the web have been created. And massively amount of that data is due to uh, social data. So already at the point where we're talking about you sending me a tweet, asking me a question, you're starting to uh, create data on the web. So alone on Twitter every day, gazillion millions pieces of data is created. Every time that you check in using a Foursquare or another geotargeting uh, applic geolocation application service, or if your GPS leaves a signal of where you are with your mobile phone, it leaves a piece of data. Um, every time you have an interaction, uh, with your friends on Facebook or with a brand on Facebook or something like that, it leaves a piece of data. And all that data have been very interesting for brands to sort of review so far and more gather, not mine so much into what it can be provided as, as value for the company. Um, if we look at something like Foursquare, Foursquare basically started out four years ago and with a vision of creating a gamification geo uh, location check-in platform. So in the beginning to get people going, the founders thought that if they created a game, it would be fun for people to, to play around and play with it. Today, and, and this just got revealed also by, the, by one of the original founders at South by Southwest uh, here in 2013, is that uh, today the, the, the Foursquare hosts so much data that it actually turns into a reputation engine, which means that all the check-in data that you have provided it now with, uh, also combined with all the data of what your friends have provided it with, it will recommend you uh, places to go, places to check in. You should, if you like to check into this sort of hotel, you should check into this sort of hotel when you arrive. So early on, you could you could go and discover stuff on on Foursquare by yourself. But now it's turning into a machine that will provide you with the intelligence of knowing you and suggesting uh, where to go. And that's sort of the essence in starting to use the data. Uh, back to the users is taking the data and providing value back to the uh, back to the users from a business intelligence perspective and and this can get you know companies will my opinion is that if you if you gather enough data and you really use the data you will in the future be able to predict how your company will live or die uh, there is no such thing more valuable than knowing much more about what your company is about or your products is, uh, are about um, and if you look a bit more into it, you can actually you can start figuring out what products should our, our, our consumers demanding instead of just thinking that they should have this sort of beer or with this sort of flavor. We could start collecting data of how they interact with products or how, what they demand. It's not just listening, it's collecting a massive amount of data that you start mining in. Um, one of the one of the, another thing is to use all the data to to gather intelligence around what your reputation as a company is. Also internally uh, amongst your colleagues, um, a lot of companies live or die with their reputation, not only externally but also internally. So I think uh, from a business intelligence perspective, people discuss that on a long term, if the chief marketing officer understands how valuable this data is and starts to really mine it and starts to predict the future with it, he has as strong as, as a weapon as the CFO of a company, the financial predictions. Uh, predictions. And that will bring him into the boardroom. So the boardroom that had never been a place to be for a, a, a CMO will be in the future if he understands how much this big data or social data, in, in essence, can tell about a company and the development of the company. Um, basically, um, this is th some of the data you can, you can use real time to react. This screenshot is from a, a dashboard that we created for a campaign launch. We had to launch a campaign over 36 hours that went across uh, all the geographical regions of the world, all continents. Uh, people would tweet, uh, celebrities would tweet at different points in time, and we needed to monitor real time what happened with everything. 
uh, not just from when they treat it, but also who picked up on it, uh, what uses uh, created something that they shouldn't, how could we amplify, or how could we uh, sort of bring p things to a stop if, if we didn't like the way it was going. So one, and, and the fun thing when developing this dashboard was that we, from the beginning of a campaign log, there was campaign uh, that was uh, merely on social, we didn't know exactly what to look, so we didn't know what our dashboard would, would be like. So we had to, had to build the dashboard also in real time. And that's one of the, what, that's one of the tricks too, is that, that everything with data is of course history and analytics, but you need to understand how to leverage this real time because when it comes to marketing and it comes to social, the, the future holds a, a very deep level of real-time marketing and not just something that we can plan over a long time. Um, if we look at content, a lot of people are used to the traditional way of marketing. We, we create marketing assets, we create a TVC, a outdoor campaign, etc. We have our goals and our objectives for that campaign. We launch the campaigns through the medias that we've chosen, and then we sit down and hopefully wait for a good result. Three months later, we get the uh, stats on how did everything perform? Did it have an increase in sales? Did it do something for our brand reputation? But basically, we're already moving on to the next uh, big campaign. When it comes to social marketing, this is an every day, you need to create stories, content on a daily basis. So all the data that people are leaving out there, data, for instance, on what they like of content from your page or what they in general like, if you have a community and you could watch whatever these person interacts with, you know, content when they talk to their friends or content when they, when they, um, when they interact with other brands, you will n be much more wiser about what sort of content you should create for, for this particular uh, community to get them more engaged in, in uh, your brand and your products or your conversations, hopefully. Um, the media planning bit is as tricky as that because we, normally we can say that we have a spend of, for instance, uh, $100,000 and we're going to put them over the next three months on our TV budget. But uh, now you have to think, okay, if I create a piece of content that performs better than other, I can, for instance, on Facebook see that from the data that a piece of content that was launched at 9 o'clock uh, on a given Tuesday starts acting uh, really well. It's, people are liking it right off. Uh, it coming, it's coming out. It's after 15 minutes. It's growing. It's growing. Now I need to amplify that piece of content because now it has much more viral value than I had anticipated from the beginning. So I, I use data to see that now I should start putting my paid media budget on that piece of content and use that to, to get it spread even more and go even more viral. And this is also a real-time interaction. So using the data to understand that you can get more from your media budget than if you just, if you just had planned it ahead of time is one of the uh, tricky uh, questions because we need, to, we need to work 24 hours a day because that piece of content might come out at 11 at night and that might be the right time for your consumers to interact with it and that should be the right time for you as a brand to also start leveraging the more potential that is in it. <clears throat> For, for instance, this is um, a way that we work uh, at Mindjumbers around a, what we call the social newsroom. So we have seen that, uh, and a lot of brands and a lot of agencies around the world have seen the, uh, the uh, urgency in being able to create content real time, right, ha right in here, right now. So there's different streams of things that needs to go into this sort of n newspaper uh, way of working. Uh, for us, it meant that we, had, we went out and hired a former online editor-in-chief uh, from uh, something called BT, a large Danish, one of the largest Danish tabloid papers, to run the operation around creating a, a news organization that can create brand-relevant news. Um, we have different strings of data that we pull into this. So there's data from the different brand communities. How do all the, the people that love Ben & Jerry's, for instance, how do they uh, react or engage with different key topics or elements or friends, etc. Um, how do they engage with our own content when we put that out? And how, how do they engage, engage to different types of conversations that are going around? A newspaper needs to know what the water cooler talk is. 
they need to know what is people going to talk about today or they need to create that story that people are going to talk about today. And as medias and people, or sorry, as companies and and uh, uh, people are becoming medias, they are starting to figure out how can I initiate uh, the conversation or how can I pick up on the conversation on the right time and be part of that. So basically you need uh, sort of content strategist editors that creates uh, the planning and everything around the content and you need content creators, uh, professional people, designers, copywriters that knows exactly what piece of content you should create. During the Super Bowl, Oreos had an example, for instance, where uh, they had a content team of 16 people sitting being, cre being ready to create something if something relevant happened. And everybody knows that the Super Bowl went dark for 15 minutes and they had a chance to create a unique piece of content that went wild because they were ready with the right people at the right time to create the right content in the right context. Uh, first and foremost, Think of the data, how can you use it to provide value to your clients um, or your customers? How can you take the data that you get and they leave for you, even maybe without knowing it or maybe sometimes knowing it, and give it back to them so that, they, that you're creating something useful for them? I have a couple of e examples here. Uh, this happened to me when I uh, headed back from, from London. I had to land in, in Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. On the way out, I was also going through Schiphol Airport and the guy was standing in the airport and he was asking me, uh, Jonas, how many times have you been here? Do you like the airport, et cetera, et cetera. I had no idea. I mean, I check in uh, everywhere I go, especially in airports, because uh, I like to keep track of what sort of airports I've been to. But I didn't have a place where I had all my data collected. Uh, I just used uh, Foursquare as my check-in point of leaving data. Uh, getting back from Boston, landing in Schiphol, I got a tweet from this company called Jet Lovers. They said, hey, congratulations with your travel. You should check this out. We got all the data. So by basically just signing in with my Foursquare, allowing to take my data of check-ins in airports, it provided me with what I actually most wanted, a flight chart of everything that I've been, every airport that I've been visiting, what's my longest flight, how many flights do I have per year, how many flights do I have per month, what airport do I come to most often, not, uh, not very surprising, it's Copenhagen. But it's, it's very interesting how they actually took data that was pretty useless to me and through a service gave it back to me. Another, another example of that is what Ray-Ban did in New York. Uh, one of the things that uh, is, is good about New York and also bad is the uh, tall buildings. It's, an, it's a fantastic city, but the tall buildings keeps the sun out and people only have a five minute break. And in that five minute break, they need to go out and get sun as fast as possible. So they created a, an app where people basically should lock what time of day they were at a certain place where they could get sun, uh, just that five minutes where they had a break. So it create, they, they, they actually created a piece of application that people could put data into and that would provide them back with useful data. The last case I want to share is probably well known to everybody, but uh, Nike Fuel Band, I tried it myself, I used it for six months. I, I lost more than uh, eight, uh, eight kilos, 16 pounds. Uh, just by being aware of the data that it collects of me having movements and translating that into something, feeding it back. Now the interesting thing, uh, if you read the book behind uh, this, uh, the, the fuel band, is that the idea was to create a marketing gimmick, the, the big splashy campaign. And suddenly they actually created a new product and maybe a new product line in, its, in essence for, for Nike. This is not the last we're gonna see of neither the fuel blend evolution or Nike sport uh, gear that, that gives uses data, provides data value to you. I think that they, uh, Nike is one of the companies that are digital aware of all the possibilities and will work with that in their product development. So now that's bringing us back to how it works as business development. With those three cases, I think uh, that covers a quick rundown on how you can use social data in your marketing effort uh, for your company. Uh, the b first step is to start monitoring, start collecting the data, be sure to have the right tools, and then start mining on them, start using the data for something. Thank you.